Good evening. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our Infrastructure Thought Leaders series, Innovative Retaining Wall Systems. My name is Amanda Rogers, and I will be your host for this evening. Firstly, in keeping with our tradition, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that this evening's webinar is being hosted with Engineers Australia's long-standing industry partner, Austral Masonry. Austral Masonry is one of Australia's largest manufacturers of concrete masonry blocks, retaining walls, pavers and stone products. Their residential solutions can be seen on high-end architectural projects and landscaping designs, while their commercial solutions, including coloured and standard masonry blocks, large-scale segmental block retaining wall products, as well as a range of, range of hard stand solutions such as commercial and permeable segmental block paving. They offer innovative solutions that provide structural integrity, excellent strength, durability, and pride themselves on making beautiful products that last forever. Throughout the past 110 years, the face of building materials has continued to evolve. We're here for a lifetime of living. This is Brickworks. More than brick, and more than just building products, we are a foundation for today's lifestyle and a leader for today's style. We manufacture a wide range of building products. Products like no other. Local and international innovation. Sourced from around the world to exceed customer expectations. Distinctive and luxurious products beautiful products that stand the test of time. Building inspiration and innovation with an unmatched standing of style. This is Brickworks. I'd now like to welcome our first speaker for today, Namir Hasnaro. Namir has been in project engineering and management for civil construction for over 15 years both in Australia and overseas. Namir's experience includes technical sales, research and development of geosynthetics and retaining walls for 12 years, design and construction, segmental retaining walls for 21 years and product development for over 10 years. Please welcome Namir Asnaro. Good evening, everyone. My name is Namir Asmaro. I'm from United Crib Blocks Construction Company, UCBC, a company that has been building retaining walls, in particular Keystone, since it was first introduced into the Australian market back in the 1990s. Today, I'll be talking about the advantages of Keystone in design and construct contracts. Keystone as a retaining system is a well-known uh, retaining uh, wall in the uh, Australian market. It's been used for many, many years, and it's been uh, uh, constructed with different uh, design heights, design loading, um, architectural designs, and therefore became one of the most um, uh, trusted and used system in the market among uh, clients, um, uh, developers, engineers, and contractors. What are design and construct contracts? Um, these are contracts that um, get the, uh, the retaining wall specialist to look at doing all the work, uh, starting from the initial costing, design aspects, tendering, then after the award, the construction supervision, supplies construction supervision, and then the design certification. So within all the, the tender uh, documents that are 
um, uh, made for that specific project, the retaining wall section is normally uh, a big or a costly part of, of that. Um, and on each project requiring retaining walls, the specialized retaining wall contractors are normally um, invited to price the design and construct uh, section of the, of the contract that's related to the retaining walls. And the specialized contractors, retaining contractors, normally offer the experience uh, from building previous projects, uh, the resources, uh, the crews, the, uh, the knowledgeable crews, skilled crews that, that can perform the work, the technical capabilities to carry on the design and the um, uh, supervision of the physical works right from the tender stage to the uh, completion. And then, the, as any other contractor, the contractual commitments and all the other uh, licenses and uh, management systems that go with that. The aim of, the, uh, of uh, getting a retaining specialist uh, involved is providing full satisfaction of the main civil contractor, meeting and meeting the statutory authorities, consultants, Australian standards and building code of Australia, as well as the industry best practices. The tendering process starts from receiving the request for tendering, RFT, from the main um, contractors or builders that are tendering for this project. And that involves a detailed review to the tender documents. So most of these tender documents in, related to the retaining walls will need to be looked at, uh, well uh, studied, and checked to all the fine details of what's required um, as a, a part of the scope of works related to the retaining walls. The assessment of the project scope and complexity, and, and that gets uh, done in the, uh, in the initial stage where the uh, retaining contractor gets into the, all the details, all the, uh, the fine details of what's involved, what's uh, required uh, from the project to be delivered. And then the timing constraints of when does the project start, when does it finish, when does the retaining section um, start, and how, um, how many walls there are, what is the timing on, of each wall, and if there is a, a stop-go um, uh, part of, of uh, the construction during the, the project program. Then prioritizing the drivers to the submission. So each retaining contractor would put their own plan of what is the time um, involved or to allow for what are the resources to commit, materials, site access, mobilization, other um, factors that, that uh, get to the priority of where to start on this project, what to do, uh, and then uh, build the submission based on that. There are other requirements such as um, are there any services corridor required behind the retaining walls, any fencing on top of the walls, sound barrier, traffic barriers, any landscaping, trees, both existing or new, newly installed or planted, then long-term design, 100 years flood design, many other details that can uh, get, uh, become a, a, a major part of the tendering or the pricing, uh, including design, supply and installation. When it comes to the design process, as the uh, retaining contractor, any, uh, all the uh, design aspects, all the technical aspects from the actual design calculation to the detailing, to the, um, uh, the drawing, the CAD uh, drawings, all that is included. And that requires 
um, obviously a bit of time and knowledge and experience, as well as engineering sense and um, analytical um, uh, knowledge of um, how to design these walls. There are project unique design conditions for each tender or each project. And these are considerations that need to be taken into account. So what are the structures, um, uh, nature uh, that require to be designed? Are they under surcharge loading, uh, being loads or uh, uh, backslope? Uh, are there any walls founded on poor foundation related to geotechnical information? Um, then special conditions and considerations of their services in the uh, right behind the wall. Is there a toe slope? Um, are there any other requirements for the design that needs to be allowed for? The minimum requirement or minimum information that um, retaining contractors require for their design and construct tender submission will be the wall prof walls profile, including the grade at the top and the bottom. So that, that's at least the, the very minimum uh, information that uh, we require to start doing the putting the designs together. Then the actual elevation of the top and the bottom of each wall. So we know what is the wall height, retained height, exposed embedment, etc. All these details would need to be uh, provided by the uh, the uh, developer or the client uh, or their consultant, so uh, the designs can become more accurate, more uh, close to the actual um, uh, numbers. And then uh, uh, the geotechnical uh, report that shows the soil parameters that uh, the retaining walls need to uh, be designed on. Obviously, for all retaining walls, all we're doing is we're retaining the soil behind these structures. So soil is a must. Soil information is a must for any uh, design and construct tender to be built on. And also a wall plan that shows where the wall site plan shows where the wall or walls are going to be built, the close proximity to uh, any structures, any existing uh, buildings or future buildings, um, any other uh, surcharge loading that needs to be allowed for, the likes of roads, footpaths, um, tanks, etc., and other geometry requirements, curves, corners, um, the change of direction of the walls, um, all these also become uh, are uh, important to be uh, to be uh, um, provided so uh, the the wall design can be um, more accurate <clears throat> what are the uncertainties that, that we find in our um, uh, tender design um, in, in cases we find that um, the drawings, the, the uh, tender documents, uh, will have incomplete retaining wall layouts. So we started making assumptions or making sometimes even guessing on how much, uh, where the wall is going or how high, or how low, what's embedment, what, um, what are the levels, uh, the RLs of uh, these walls. The other thing would be the missing geotech information. Um, and th that doesn't happen all the time. But in, in some cases, uh, again, we have to make our own assumptions because of um, there will be one or two um, boreholes that, uh, that show the, the soil parameters. Uh, and in many cases, these uh, boreholes are actually away from where the walls are. Uh, so um, that that make us um, you know make our own assumptions based on that. Um, then uh, the short tendering time, uh, such as uh, five days is in average, where we receive the RFT and then uh, the submissions required within five time five days, 
it is okay for um, for a small, medium size uh, tenders, but for large jobs, it's definitely um, you know puts a lot of uh, pressure on uh, our tendering and design team to uh, finalize it and uh, make the submission on time. The other uh, note is that uh, there are some times that we receive notes that, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the notes on the drawings that would say draft or to be confirmed or future works. And if you notice here, if you see this um, uh, note that I've put here around this point here, um, if we look at um, what's this referring to, it's proposed retaining wall by others, size and type to be confirmed during detailed design. So it doesn't really give you much room to move on, on what is it that um, the client is looking for and, you know, what details what uh, in the tender stage. Yes, the detailed design will, will be all finalized, but not necessarily in the tender stage. Um, and, and also the, the, uh, the, uh, the clarity on pricing of certain items. So we find that in many cases we again make our own assumption of whether to supply the structural backfill material for example or the capping blocks or the uh, the embedment part of the wall is this included or is it not um, in the tendering stage as a contractor we want to have our submission as um, competitive and low um, total as possible so we, we, we stay competitive in the market um, with other um, tenderers. Um, any item that is added to the, the lump sum becomes, uh, puts the price up uh, and puts us at risk of losing uh, the, uh, the tender altogether. Likewise, if we underestimate uh, and then um, we don't price sing certain items, uh, if we win the job, we will then be asked uh, about these items which we haven't allowed for. So it, it, is, it, it does create some sort of uncertainty in some tenders. Um, and then there, is the, the, there are also tenders that require the use of on-site materials. doesn't happen quite often, but it does uh, sometimes. And when that happens, it also puts us in a, in a bit of a situation where how do we actually manage this? How do we deal with this? Because the on-site material um, needs to, to be tested, needs to be approved, and uh, to meet the, uh, the minimum requirements. And, and that doesn't always um, look um, sort of um, attractive to the builder or to the contractor to use. Um, also asking a lump sum price uh, versus the, uh, the unit rates can become sometimes risky because the lump sum is what then governs the uh, the award or the the winning of the job or losing the job. While in many cases, um, um, different tenderers will um, look at uh, the way the the tender in a different way, come up with their own assumptions, and then make um, you know uh, that can. Um, price extra items or un, un price or non, no price for other items, etc. Where we offer alternative designs to the um, to the uh, conforming design, and that's where we have the uh, the options of offering the likes of keystone retaining walls. Um, as an option for to achieve either cost savings, time saving, aesthetics, uh, solution to close proximity to boundary, or infill soil types. So we can um, amend that uh, and offer alternative to it to have um, a cost saving for the client. What are the most common retaining wall systems available in the market that we as uh, United Crip um, use and, and build. Um, there is the, um, as you can see here, the uh, uh, panel, post and panel, uh, or other known others, um, uh, otherwise known as sleepers. Uh, there's the crib walls. There is the bucket walls. 
and there is the uh, traditional core filled masonry walls and there is a keystone wall which is the subject of this presentation. What are the advantages that we uh, get out of using Keystone, offering Keystone um, as a, uh, a preferred retaining wall system? First, it offers the design flexibility. You can do a lot with uh, Keystone retaining walls that uh, other systems may not be able to. And in particular, being a small modular block system, it does give you that uh, flexibility to build uh, the wall around tight corners, curves um, in uh, uh, sites where access is a, a problem. Um, also, it gives you that flexibility of building the wall on a, um, a non-reinforced concrete pad. So no reinforcement required, no uh, heavy sort of um, concrete footing is needed. You're placing pretty much the wall on the soil, uh, given that the bearing capacity of that soil is enough to take the load of the, the, this wall. The other reason is uh, aesthetics. So for uh, Keystone, it comes in different colors, different textures, different finishes, and that allows um, uh, the builder and even the, the, the consultant, the client, to choose from different options or uh, combine many options in the same wall, which uh, gives that flexibility that you won't uh, find in other systems. It is the finished product, so you don't need to paint it, you don't need to uh, render it. Uh, uh, whatever is built the first time is what stays and, and uh, throughout the whole design life of the structure. Cost-wise, very cost-effective compared to other systems, um, as it um, it only involves um, a 300 millimeter facing concrete blocks, and and these are units that you can easily use. Uh, you can place with good production rate and use um, relatively low cost backfill material and reinforcement, geogrid reinforcement in the back. The ease of installation, what you need to, to have is a crew of four um, uh, workers um, that can uh, place the blocks from the pallet to the, the site, which doesn't take a um, long time and it, uh, it's easy to, to do. There's no mortar, there's no concrete, there's no uh, other um, additional items that follow these, the uh, placement of the block, apart from the backfilling and the compaction. The actual performance of keystone walls has been tested for more than 30 years now, 40 years. And uh, many large structures have been built through these 40 years. And these have been performing all the way through till now. And, uh, showed very little to no uh, signs of uh, movement, deterioration, uh, change of the, uh, of the facing or the finish or even the, the structure um, performance throughout all these years. Then you have the durability of the, the, uh, the blocks. These blocks are made of um, high strength, dry, dry uh, mix concrete. So they are 21 plus MPA uh, strength blocks and are actually, uh, they don't let any uh, the blocks, to, uh, they don't absorb any uh, water or very little water. Um, it's um, and the nature of these blocks, is because they are flexible, they are, they, they are durable, um, they can actually move, they accept movement in, in the wall so a slight um, um, uh, differential settlement or side movement for any other uh, reasons, these blocks, these walls are not rigid. And that's why they're, they're flexible, that they can accept these movements without showing any signs on the facing. Um, the units are uniform in weight. So each block is well tested uh, in terms of weight, dimensional tolerance, strength and durability. So it's very hard to find this 
uh, these features in other uh, retaining wall systems as what you find here at, um, in Keystone. Um, for DNC specific uh, advantages, it's a one system that fits all applications. So from highway wall, walls to bridge abutments, erosion control, parking areas, landscaping, high wall, low walls, low bearing, high bearing walls. Um, it's, uh, it's the same block. You're using the same block from the first course to the top course. There's no different strengths or different sizes, different shapes. It's only one block that you're using all the, excuse me, all the way through uh, without any complexity, without any, any uh, variety of, of uh, blocks or, or units uh, that you use. Same block from first course to the, to the top course. There's a speed of construction. That, that's uh, that's uh, definitely a, a fact which we find building other retaining wall systems. Keystone offers that speed of construction because it, it, it's not there's nothing stopping um, the construction wheel from spinning. You, you're always building these walls, placing the blocks, uh, putting the pins in, and then uh, putting the next uh, course on top, and then uh, backfilling, placing geogrids, etc. So it's, it's the repetition of the same, same uh, steps right from course one to the top course. And, and that's where the speed is, is sort of um, a, a natural thing that happens. It's a simple system. So, you, 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 again, no complexity. It, it's a repetition of the same step every time. Um, Keystone offers a, a design software. It's called Keywall Pro or Keywall Program. And, and that's a, a quite a, a, a great tool to use for uh, design and construct contractors because it does uh, give you the option of using all type of grids that are, that are available here, all different types of blocks that are available in Australia, as well as the, the fact that it gives you all the details, the design details, um, uh, AS4678. Um, it also gives you the, uh, the options of uh, using uh, any type of loading, uh, surcharge, any type of soil parameters, and it, it lets you um, really um, gives you all the uh, flexibility in, in using it. Plus, it, it has a CAD uh, drawing facility that lets you uh, draw the, the walls with good, uh, accurate ta uh, takeoffs, which helps obviously the tenders in coming up with the right quantities. Uh, the availability of blocks is always there. Uh, the manufacturers around Australia always have stock, and uh, before they run out of stock, uh, they're mass produced uh, products, so they can make thousands of square meters within a couple of days. Um, the experience and knowledge also, because of um, the contractors that have been built these walls quite often, uh, they built up that, that knowledge and that experience uh, with their um, uh, methods, ways of, of construction. The other uh, fact that th these walls offer is that um, you can actually build on top of existing wall or reduce the height of wall with very minimal work um, required. You don't need to have any, um, any um, sort of uh, breakage or, or demolition uh, more than just um, unstack the blocks and then place uh, additional ones or, or remove the top three, four courses. Uh, some design um, adjustment is required, but normally it's, it's a minimal. And this is a, a cross section showing a wall that's um, four or five meters and a wall that's uh, one meter. And you can see that we're talking the same facing, same blocks, same grids, same uh, drainage material at the back, same base leveling pad. Whenever, as you go up higher with the keystone wall, you're not adding any um, costly items apart from the uh, grid links and the, the backfill material. The facing is exactly the same and so on. So, and that's why higher wall and, and lower wall with Keystone are very close in, in the pricing. That's it for now. And um, I hope that uh, it's been helpful and um, I'll be um, more than happy to take any questions after the presentation. So uh, thanks again for listening, and I'll um, 
I'll uh, take you now back to uh, Amanda to introduce the next speaker. Regards, thanks. Thank you, Namir, for your insights. I'd now like to welcome our second speaker, Mark Wilson. Mark is a Director of Costing Row Consulting and the organization's Head of Civil Engineering, with over 20 years experience as a consulting engineer and three as a surveyor in Australia and overseas. Mark possesses immense theoretical and practical knowledge about the design and engineering of modular retaining walls for large scale industrial development infrastructure projects. Segmental retaining wall systems feature extensively in many of the firm's recent and current projects in Western Sydney, including the Marsden Park Industrial Estate, Horsley Drive Business Park and Eastern Creek Business Park stages three and four. Costing Road Consulting was highly commended for excellence in integrated stormwater design at the Stormwater New South Wales Awards in 2020. The firm also won the ACSE New South Wales Award for Excellence in Structural Engineering and Usual Projects for its work on the innovative Viola Woodlawn MBT facility near Canberra. Please welcome Mark Wilson. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining this Thought Leader series of seminars on modular retaining wall structures. Before I start, I'd like to thank Namir for his seminar and insights into the design construct wall process and Engineers Australia for hosting the event. My name's Mark Wilson. I'm a director of Cost and Row Consulting and the head of the civil engineering design arm of the firm. I've been involved in the design construction retaining walls for almost 20 years being first introduced to the modular wall system in 2003. Modular walls, namely keystone reinforced earth walls, feature extens extensively in the infrastructure and logistics distribution type projects our company specialises in. I'd like to share some of the experience and knowledge I've gained with these retaining wall systems throughout my career. My seminar will focus on the use of modular wall system in relation to the design, construction of large format industrial logistics and distribution facility type projects in Western Sydney. These type of projects typically see construction of retaining structures between three and six metres in height. However, in many instances, the walls can be in the 12 to 15 metre range or even larger. As an overview of my seminar, I'll give a brief summary of the components of a modular block wall, what drives the need for large retaining walls on a project and the opportunities constraints of modular wall systems. I'll also provide a number of examples of some of the more interesting wall constructions on some recent projects. So what is a modular wall? A modular wall has a few different names. Reinforced earth wall, mechanically stabilised earth wall, or commonly referred to as a keystone wall. I may use one or all of these terminologies during the seminar, but generally I'll refer to these walls as reinforced earth or keystone. A reinforced earth wall is essentially a mass gravity wall. All the normal design assessment checks, including overturning, sliding, wedge failure, global stability, all need to be made. However, there'll be other checks specific to the system like facing connection che checks, creep failure, bulging and strap tensile checks. Facing units or modular block, although an integral part of the wall, really only provides a means for connecting the earth straps and to contain the soil, the mass soil block at the face of the system. The mass soil block, block comprises a select fill zone is stabilised either by layers of horizontally spanning G grids or steel straps. This zone force forms the key structural component of the wall and its width can range between a minimum of 0.7 times the wall height to one and a half the wall height, depending on the loading and the materials used in the select fill zone. Typically, we see geogrids being used in most wall constructions 
with steel struts only being adopted for very high walls, say greater than 14 metres, or if a strict settlement re requirement is needed. The select fill will normally need to have a reasonably high friction value of around 34 degrees or higher. Sydney is quite lucky in this regard in that it has an abundant supply of sandstone, which usually meets the parameters required for the select fill. Lower quality materials, including clay, can be utilised in reinforced earth structures with additionally close, closely spaced straps and extended strap lengths. However, care must be taken to consider increased movement and sensitivity to moisture changes. For most applications, the use of a select fill with a high friction angle is recommended over clay or other lower parameter materials. There are a few ways in which the design and construction of the walls can be completed. As discussed uh, by Namir, we commonly see the walls being constructed via a design and construct process. Geotech, geometrical and performance requirements, including load, loading settlement criteria are defined by the engineering designers and then the structural requirements of the system, including strap length, type and spacing will be completed by the design and construct contractor and their wall engineer based on the defined criteria. We typically see this type of application completed many walls with Namir and UCBC using this system. What drives the need for large walls on a distribution centre project? It's a simple equation. If you place a flat building, which is three, four, even 500 metres in length and up to 60,000 square metres in area on an undeveloped undulating site, there'll be a difference between the existing ground and the developed ground levels that will need to be addressed by either a retaining structure or some other means like a steep batter. The demand for distribution facilities and the size of buildings overall has increased largely over the last five to 10 years in response to the internet and online buying revolution, which has then been heightened by a global pandemic. Sydney has moved from a period where land values were low and rent high enough that the cost of retaining structures were less, were less desirable design solution. And it was more common to address level changes via steep landscape batters and limited wall construction. As land values and rental return outweigh the cost of retaining wall construction, less use of battering and more use of retaining walls has resulted. This in combination with larger buildings has resulted in larger walls on many projects. A reinforced earth wall system can be seen to be a very economical wall system in most instances. Further reasons for larger walls comes about with the availability of land for development and the land which is available being more topographically challenging for large format distribution construction. An example of where the landform presents a challenge of the need for large level difference between the developed site and existing landform is the newly rezoned industrial precinct at Kemp's Creek in Western Sydney. There's around 70 metres level difference across the precinct from its highest level at RL 100 metres to the lowest at RL 30. Cut to fill earthworks up to 20 metres are anticipated in some areas and careful consideration to addressing these level ch changes whilst meeting authority requirements and having the economics of the construction meet commercial requirements and development. An example of a design profile in Kemp's Creek with significant level difference has been shown on the slide. What things do we need to think about when designing a project around a reinforced earth wall? There are many things that need to be considered concurrently. Some of the key items we need to think about are when the wall will be built, where is the building in relation to the wall, what loading do we need to consider, what uses are there on the site, and are any of these uses sensitive to settlement or movement, and what services do we need to install to service the development? For distribution 
development, the length of the earth would typically be around 20% greater than the height of the wall. This means for a six metre high wall, the select fill zone will be around 7.2 metres in length. A warehouse building will normally be as large as possible and oftentimes will be within or over the select fill the strap zone of influence. How then do we install services if the wall is constructed before the building and service installation would damage the structure of the wall? Service zones will need to be either provided in the initial design or services installed as part of the wall construction. Examples of where service zones have been provisioned to enable the building to be constructed after the building is being constructed and for service to be installed during the wall construction and integrated in the wall structure shown on the slide. Most councils have policies in place with the objectives of improving the visual amenity of a retaining wall. Generally, most authorities don't like seeing large expanses of vertical walls facing the street or public domain. The most commonly adopted measure authorities employ to overcome this issue is to introduce landscape terraces and setbacks in their development controls. Generally, walls and plants don't mix due to roots damaging components and much variability in garden beds. However, with shallow planting zones, additional geogrids and drainage in the upper layers of the terrace, these issues can be overcome. Successful landscape planting can be introduced in a reinforced earth wall. Some landscaping terracing has been demonstrated here on a site in Eastern Creek. The local council on this project Blacktown Council requires a one and a half metre landscape terrace for every three metre rise in level for any wall which can be seen from the public domain. Module walls are inherently flexible systems. Differential movement can sometimes occur between the reinforced earth fill zone and retained fill zone, which results in soil cracking. Differential movement can occur due to several mechanisms as demonstrated in the included figure. These mechanisms can include consolidation of the reinforced backfill zone or retained soil wedge, lateral wall movement due to active earth pressure or foundation settlement. With careful detailing, these issues can be mitigated. More common layers of geo extend several metres past the remainder of the select fill zone or for a biaxial grid to be provided between the select fill zone and retained material to reduce the opportunity for soil cracking at the finished development surface. The next slide shows some non-typical applications using modular blocks. The first detail shows a design which includes a modular wall with reinforced earth in combination with a no fines concrete backfill wall. This combination has been used in a cut wall application over a rock face comprising sandstone and shale geology. Where the sandstone is present and the cut face is stronger and less susceptible to weathering, a thinner non-structural facing using keystone blocks and no fines concrete has been constructed. And where the softer rock, which would also be susceptible to weathering is present, stabilisation with geogrid strapping select fill zones are used. This application provides an economical and aesthetic means of achieving stabilisation over more traditional types of protection like shotcrete or crib wall construction. Second detail shows a non-structural application, which has been required to meet one of Council's landscape and visual amenity requirements. The reinforced earth wall in front of a short section of a 10.5 metre high anchored shot soldier pile and shot creek wall provides no structural support to the system. Keystone wall construction was required on the last 10 to 15 metres of a 100 metre long soldier pile wall where a small section of the wall was visible to the street. Final application was used again as a non-structural screen to a storm tension tank. The client wished for con continuity of the keystone wall through the entirety of the development. As such, this required careful detailing to continue the facing of the adjacent keystone 
reinforced earth wall structure past the stormwater detention tank, which was constructed using a traditional reinforced concrete block. In this instance, the keystone blocks were tied to the, to the reinforced core field block structure and then filled with no fines concrete. Modular blocks allow for some interesting geometry, including large and tight radius curves. Some examples of curved wall detailing shows a requirement for the geogrid reinforcement to be overlapped in both convex and concave curvatures. One of the case studies I'll talk about shortly shows some interesting use of curvature in its construction. Now I'll run through four real life applications of keystone and modular wall systems, including a site at Marsden Park in Northwest Sydney, two sites in Eastern Creek and one Wetherill Park in Western Sydney. The walls on this site at Marsden Park, although not particularly high, each section being around three metres, is interesting in that it combines an open stormwater detention basin used to detain stormwater runoff and a bioretention system which will clean the stormwater prior to discharge in and around a series of reinforced earth walls in combination with traditional reinforced concrete block wall construction. In a 100, one in 100 year rainfall event, the water level to the reinforced earth wall would be up to two metres at the base of the wall, though only for a relatively short period of time. Consideration to saturation of the select fill zone and a potential for reduction in the overall strength of the wall as a result of sat saturation was required. To overcome this potential issue, the use of a more robust select fill material was adopted. In this case, a crushed rock road-based gravel was used over sandstone to reduce the risk of reduced strength of the system when wet and additional concrete core filling of the lower block courses to reduce the opportunity for water egress into the select fill zone. This design at Eastern Creek in Western Sydney required relocation of the Upper Angus Creek in addition to support of the adjacent buildings and integration of stormwater treatment systems, including two bioretention basins at the tops of the wall landscape tiering, construction of the walls across a series of large box culverts where the estate road crosses the upper Angus Creek. The walls on this site were all keystone geogrid with heights ranging from three metres up to 12. Eastern Creek Business Park Stage 5 required a combined approach again around a stormwater management system. Stormwater controls for this site necessitated a wetland in combination with a bioretention basin detention system. The overall level, level differences were upward of 12 metres. The design included significant reinforced earth wall construction in combination with landscape batters, construction of trunk drainage pipelines through the wall structure and installation of large gross pollutant traps in the zone of influence of the wall. This system constructed in 2017 provides a holistic design approach balancing the cost of wall construction with the development potential of the land in combination with topographical and environmental considerations. During the planning phase of this development at Wetherill Park, local council and state authorities had significant concerns relating to aesthetics the 12 metre level difference between the development site and the adjacent roadway, and the detailing of the retaining structures required to accommodate the level difference. The design team formulated an interesting design solution which employed a combination of curved keystone wall construction with terraced landscape zones in combination with the lower three metre portion being constructed using gabion wall construction. Global stability assessment was required due to the complexity of the structure. Global stability assessment required the introduction of geogrid layers and select fill to the retained zones of the lower gabion sections of the wall, in addition to the upper keystone components of the wall. 
This results in the select fill and GE grid strap zone being applied to all components of the wall and the upper and lower sections acting as a single acidity system. The end product can seen, be seen to be or provide a unique visually pleasing result. The curved wall, stepped and landscaped terraces providing the intended reduction in overall bulk which could have resulted from an alternate design solution. I note this wall has been used by Engineers Australia as part of their marketing for this and previous seminars on the topic and is a great example of innovative wall design solutions. This brings me to the end of my seminar. In summary, it can be seen that Keystone modular wall systems can allow flexible and innovative design solutions for developments. Key constraints for the majority of these walls is usually related to time of construction, associated service installation. However, other constraints, including differential settlement, can also provide some limitations. Overall, with due consideration to these items in the design phase, the modular wall provides a great engineering solution to enable flat buildings to be developed in undulating landform with large level difference. Thanks again for attending the seminar and I hope you gain some insights into the modular and reinforced earth wall solutions through my talk. Now we'll go back to Amanda for the Q&A session. Um, we'll speak again shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our presenters this evening, uh, Namir and Mark, for those insights. Um, it's now your turn to get involved. Uh, thank you to everyone who sent questions in through the chat box. You still have time to send through a question. So if you do want to send a question through, just send it through the chat box. I also want to thank everyone that sent through questions on registration. And we might start with uh, one of those. We've got about 30 minutes of, of Q&A, which is great. Um, we have a question that came in from Robert. Good evening, Robert. Robert is based in Queensland. He's directing this to you, Namir, first, and then to Mark. And the question Robert is asking is, can you please explain the impacts and options for services in the backfill zone where footings and stormwater is quite common? Are there fencing options? Namir? Yeah, we, we find this. Thanks for the question. Uh, it's um, actually uh, it's a common uh, uh, fact that we, uh, we face uh, in uh, the projects we build. Um, services are a fact that they, they need to be allowed for in the design. They need to be allowed for uh, during construction. Depends on what time that service goes. Uh, in cases we um, needed to allow for a, a geogrid uh, free zone for future service installation. In other cases, we needed to work around existing services or the service were installed uh, during construction. Thank okay. you. Uh, Mark, do you want to comment on that too? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think the mere covered off a lot of the items there but there were a couple of slides that i demonstrated options for allowing for the service or g grid free zone obviously if you're um trying to trench a service in you can't do that through the geogrid zone because that damages the structural integrity of the retaining wall um so really you, you do need to think about where those services are going to go prior to the design of the wall. Um, we quite often allow for geogrid free zones in the design or if you can't work around a geogrid free zone, we'll um, work our designs through so those sorts of can be integrated within the wall structure and the structure does allow services to be installed within with the geogrids wrapping around essentially if there's a large storm with a pipe that the geogrids can wrap around those systems um we're talking about fencing what usually is done there is you will install a sleeve maybe a 300 millimeter pvc pipe that's a meter long upper layer of wall so that that's placed 
when the wall builders build the wall and then the fences can come along and put their posts in that and then they just fill those with concrete or, or some other stabilizing material so that's typically what's done the fences and fences come in after the wall has been constructed thanks mark thank you for that um we've had a question come in from Yusia, who's based in new south wales good evening uh the question is to you namir and you see is asking is we get this question asked a lot in this series and um, it keeps coming up is this innovative retaining wall cost effective when compared to traditional retaining wall Thanks for the question. Yes, it is. Um, depending on the height, the design loading, soil parameters, but in most cases, uh, it is very cost effective. And, and that's, um, that's in first materials that are used, the speed of construction, the productivity uh, of the crews that build these walls, and then the sort of the flexibility and durability. It, it is the the last, the final product that we uh, installed. So we don't need to do any extra work uh, after the installation. That's why the cost becomes very, uh, very uh, competitive. Thank you. Thanks, Namir. And over to you, Mark. Uh, we've had a question come in tonight asking, do you encourage the use of a design checklist, checklist to be approved and signed by a relevant stakeholder as part of a design review and allowing the IFC drawing to be issued to the contractors. Mark. Sure. Um, look, we don't often see design checklists per se, but what we often do see is um, the client may have the design peer review. Um, so often the um, once the wall designer has completed their design and they'll prepare a, their design certification and calculation package and a drawing package they'll normally then be reviewed by the peer reviewing engineer um, who will then prepare an itemized list of any areas that may be clarification or emissions etc they'll usually then be and then maybe one or two rounds of drawing updates before the final drawings are then issued for construction. So, yes, we don't often see one checklist, but certainly a, a thorough process to ensure that all the right things are being considered in the, in the design. Thanks, Mark. And we are just having a little difficulty with the with the reception, so I might just. Um, flick over to Namir and ask the next, next couple of questions and hopefully we can uh, get that sorted out. We've had a great question that's come in from Victor. Uh, Victor's asking, how do we reconcile the conflict of interest between builder and designer in a DNC contract? Thanks, Namir. Thanks, Victor. It is, a um, again, a, a common question that we get asked as uh, designing construct uh, contractors. Firstly, we're working in an industry where there are, there are uh, rules and, and, um, and uh, systems in place, and there are different um, uh, stakeholders and, um, and sort of parties um, uh, uh, involved where, um, where we can um, sort of get the, the design and construction running a parallel without having to have conflict uh, in between the two. Therefore, we can, uh, like in, in terms of the design, for example, that gets peer reviewed before we start the construction. And then our construction is also um, uh, supervised by the client, the representative being the engineers, the consultants on site or the superintendent. So uh, there is no such a uh, conflict uh, visible in the uh, in the actual work. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thanks, Namir. Thank you for that. Um, staying with you just for now, we've um, had a question come in from Mohammed. Good evening. Um, asking you, can this wall ret retain water? And what are the measurements in this case in terms of protection layers? Geo 
geotextiles, dam proofing, etc. Thank you, Mohamed. Thanks, Mohamed. I've, uh, I haven't seen uh, keystone walls used as a uh, waterproofing uh, retain or, or tank uh, wall type uh, structures. They are they have been used in um, uh, uh, facing water or submerged even in lakes and, and water um, uh, ways, but not really retaining water. Um, simply because they are designed to retain soil. The geogrids need to be uh, connected, to be filled in within a uh, reinforced uh, or in within a... Okay, um, I might just ask a question. I think we might have just temporarily lost uh, Namir. Um, Mark, um, we've had a question come in from Kelvin in Queensland tonight asking, no, that's okay. Um, just, yeah, you just keep going, Namir, and just finish off that. I'm yeah. sorry. Maybe just go back a little bit. Yes. All right. Um, so I, I was saying that the, the water, um, the Keystone is not suitable to retain water only. It has to have a soil that is retained. This is why it's a retaining wall. It's not a tank wall. Um, it cannot be used, uh, as far as I, I know, uh, through the experience, um, it, it cannot be used as a, as a tank uh, wall. Um, simply because it, it's also, it's got all the, uh, the voids, the gaps in between the joints of the wall and between the blocks. And it's, um, it's not been designed uh, for um, uh, retaining water. Thank you. Thank you, Mimir. And thank you. Sorry about that, Mark. Over to you with the question again from Kelvin, who's based in Queensland, uh, asking, are analysis and design methods, guides or examples um, available? Uh, yes, they are. I mean, design of the reinforced earth walls in Australia would be via the Australian standard 4678 earth retaining structures. Um, all the design checks are in there, but there is also some other guidelines um, which have worked examples. For example, the Concrete Masonry Association of Australia has a um, has a guideline document that has fully worked examples based on the Australian standard. Um, there's also design software available. Um, there's a keywall program um, which Keystone puts out that has various different um, wall and geogrid uh, combinations included in there, um, which you can then use for design and analysis purposes. Um, they're, they're probably the, the, the three kind of key guides. And obviously there's a design map of the key, key um, keystone walls as well as the design program that you can do pan calculation as well. Thanks, Mark. And sort of moving on to the tools um, in this world, Namir Shane is asking you a question. Um, and a few people have asked this, how do we get access to the design software? Thanks, Shane. Um, it's uh, easy. Uh, you either go to the website uh, of the uh, the American uh, uh, Keystone uh, page, so that's keystonewalls.com, or uh, get in contact with uh, the local uh, supplier, uh, being Austral in New South Wales and other and other states. Uh, the third option is to contact the uh, Keystone representative in Australia, Darren Gardner. He's based in North Queensland. Otherwise, I can help if you want to get in contact with myself uh, directly. I, I don't have a problem. I will help you as much as I can. Thank, Thank you. you. And just, just staying with you, I will group these two questions together. Um, the sure. first one comes from Pack, and he's asking, how do we assess the movement of keystone walls and also a question's come in from Mario from VDM Consulting Engineers and we are asked this one a lot how high can you build with this these type of blocks? Namir. Yep thanks for the questions. Um, movements are uh, governed by um, the uh, Australian standard 4678 so you, you, uh, you can have 
a maximum of uh, four to one thousand uh, mm -hmm. movements. So if you're um, if you have a ten meter high wall, you can uh, you're allowed to have that forty millimeter movement, and that's uh, both vertical, so uh, settlement vertical or uh, side movement or rotation. Um, in, in regards to the um, maximum height, the highest wall built in Australia to date is uh, the wall that UCBC built last year uh, in Oakdale West Industrial, and that's 14.3 maximum height. The highest wall in the world, uh, I'm, I understand, is more than 25 uh, meters in China. So you can actually get uh, higher, but you then are limited with the soil capacity, the soil uh, bearing capacity, and also the room that you have behind the wall, because as the higher you go, the longer the geogrids uh, you need. Um, so that, that actually becomes the sort of the governing factor in the, the maximum height. Thank you. Thanks, Samir. And addressing the standards, Mark, um, Manuel has asked a couple of questions, but they're quite different, so I'm going to separate them out. Um, Manuel's asking, is there any specific standard for designing key wall retaining walls? Mark. Sure. This, this probably has a little bit of crossover with the... Yeah, this has some crossover with the answer I gave before there. Um, so, yes, the Australian standard is for six, seven, eight earth retaining structures. Um, however, there are other standards used for um, public infrastructure, for example, highways. Um, each state will have their own relevant um, road authority guidelines. Um, in New South Wales, that would be Transport for New South Wales, which is formerly the RMS or RTA, uh, and they have their own design standards for these type of walls which typically are a little stricter than the 4678 um, Australian standard. They'll often have a longer design life around 100 years whereas the Australian standard could be um, between 30 and 60 years uh, and they quite often have a more strict requirement on um, settlement and movement and also in the um, select fill that's utilised in, um, in the system. Sometimes they, they may, you know, have, instead of putting in sandstone backfill, they'll be using a, a road base, crushed rock road base, to get that longer overall durability and um, tighter settlement criteria work through. Um, so yeah, that, that that's really where it is for for, for standards in, in Australia. Um, you said there was a second question there, Amanda. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that. And sort of like you know, we talk a lot about in these series like extending asset life, and um, Manuel has also asked a question around the retention anchors towards the filling. Um, is there a possibility of different materials, i.e., composite, for preventing corrosion? Thank you. Sure. Uh, with the with the reinforced earth walls, um, corrosion is probably one of the lower considerations, given that there's not really any metallic um, metallic materials within the system. Um, the blocks are a concrete masonry. The straps are uh, you know geogrid straps, plastic type um, material. Um, the locating pins are fiberglass. Um, so look, corrosion in those type of wall is, is a low consideration. When, when or if, it, I guess, steel straps are used, then that corrosion consideration comes into play. Um, there are criteria around the um, material in terms of the pH to reduce the... Um, I guess opportunity for corrosion from um, you know, highly acidic or, or alkaline materials. That pH needs to be in the four to nine range. Um, that's certainly 
needed for the geogrid layers as well is to is to have the durability there for um you know essentially stable chemical characteristics of the select fill um you know sometimes some of the sandstone that we see used here has, is out of the, the tolerance range for the the required ph and is not able to be used in the select fill zone for the reinforced earth walls um yes yeah, so the reinforced earth walls will require um you know a strict strict um parameters for durability um creep and yeah overall long-term stability of the, of the structure thank you Mark. and Samir, we, we talked a little bit about the cost of these walls compared to traditional um retaining wall system but Mohammed has just taken it a little bit further and the question that Mohammed is asking, at which wall height is the keystone, does the keystone wall start to be cheaper than traditional walls? Thanks, Mohammed. The um, uh, question is, um, is common. Uh, we, we get uh, asked uh, a lot about it and not only with the uh, standard masonry blocks, block walls but other systems it is a um, there's no like golden rule for uh, where uh, what height the wall gets cheaper in this system or the other but the higher you go with uh, with keystone uh, the more cost effective uh, it becomes so i would say from experience three meters plus you're uh, in a very good um, sort of uh, uh, situation to uh, use Keystone as opposed to other systems. Even below the three meters, depending on what uh, the retaining wall is uh, supporting, is, is there a, a loading, is the soil, a good soil that's retaining? Um, is it in a close proximity to the boundary? Um, many other factors that can play a role in uh, the cost overall cost but overall uh three meter i would say you you will be uh, in a very good position thank you thanks namir and just staying with you for now uh ronaldo has sent through a question uh, good evening asking um can this keystone block be customized slash cut to suit angle requirements namir? Yeah. Yep, thanks, um, Ronaldo. Uh, yeah, the blocks can be cut uh, with a concrete uh, saw. Um, the uh, normally we we try to avoid cutting the blocks because it um, it disturbs or disrupts the sequence of the of the joints. Uh, so when you put the next course on top you will sort of lose that, that um, uh, dynamic of uh, putting the, you know, building the rows on top. However, at the end of the wall, yes, you can e like uh, easily cut these blocks to suit. Um, if you have a, a corner where you have a change of direction of the wall, that's another area where uh, the blocks get uh, cut to suit. Um, and then every course you will have um, to cut uh, the blocks, and, but you still need to have that joint sort of uh, staggered uh, rather than having a one one um, joint uh, where possible. Uh, in, in our practical um, uh, experience, we learned that uh, going around um, right corners uh, is better to build with, with uh, curves to avoid having to cut these blocks or, uh, you know, uh, ease that, that, um, that sort of high uh, uh, tension area around the corners. So we, we go with a smooth curve around these corners, uh, work much better. Thanks. Thanks, Samir. And Mark, back to you with a design question that's come in asking, did you consider the design connection detail between blocks and soil reinforcement how about surface treatment requirement, fastener, steel reinforcement? Sure. Um, thanks for the question. So typically the connection of the reinforcement material to the facing blocks will be made either by a friction or a mechanical connection. 
Um, the friction connection is most typically used in most walls that we we um, construct. Um, the straps are placed over the block. There's then a um, connection and alignment pin placed, which then um, is the voids are then filled with with aggregate, the drainage aggregate and the drainage layer um, prior to then the next block being placed on top of it. And it's the weight of those blocks um, on top of each strap that really provide the um, tensile capacity and connection to the facing unit. So um, you often find that the tensile capacity is lower at the top of the wall and it increases somewhat um, through the middle of the wall and then it starts to reduce as you get towards the base of the wall where you have higher overall um, tent or retaining wall loading from the reinforced um, fill zone. Um, mechanical connections such as the TW3 provide a full inter interlocking connection, um, which provides an increased connection capacity and I guess reduced um, opportunity for, for movement of the facing units between the, the soil and the, um, and the blocks. Um, and those design capacities are based on testing, which is completed in a lab um, under controlled conditions um, and the testing will be done on uh, a variety of blocks. There's um, you know, several different types of facing blocks out in the marketplace, and there's many different um, reinforcing grid suppliers in the marketplace as well. So each of those combinations needs to be tested, uh, and then those values utilised doing your design assessments um, depending on which block and which geogrid you're using um, and those yeah once you have that information you can then compare that to the um, design loading and ensure that you've met your um, pull out or tensile check criteria. Thanks, Mark. Thank you for that. Uh, the questions come in, um, Namira, talking about as, foot, as the footing is below ground, um, is an expansion joint required? If the footing is stepped, vertical, it's vertical step required. Does that makes sense. <laughs> yep. No, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, expansion joints are normally uh, uh, placed to, to uh, have that. Uh, uh, sort of movement, uh, allow for movement in, in case of uh, temperature effects, particular high temperature, low temperature, etc. Um, but construction joints, if you're also including that, yes, these <clears throat> can be required if uh, we have a, a service under the, the wall where um, we build a, a bridge over the service and then pile down to uh, away from the influence zone, then we would or may require a, an expansion joint, sorry, a, a, a construction joint. Um, there are other cases where uh, if we're building over a structure uh, or um, a, a sort of a rock that's on the way of the retaining wall alignment, um, then we will need to ha have some sort of um, a construction joints to allow the wall to, to move separately around that rigid surface um, or even a, 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 a like a, a, channel, a, a stormwater a pipe or outlet um, under the wall. Again, in that case, we would need some uh, a sort of a construction joint. Otherwise, if we're talking about a consistent wall over a, um, a sort of a, a, a same soil, then uh, there's no need for uh, construction joints. Thanks. Thanks, Namir. And just staying with you, we've had a question coming from Anthony in Tasmania, who's asking us, would the system, system be suitable for high six metre plus embankment batters for road, road construction, Namir? 
Thanks for the question. I just need to clarify. Uh, six meter of embankment, meaning like on top of the wall, or are we talking <clears throat> the wall actually doing the retaining of six meters? So Anthony has just sort of put this as embankment slash batters for road construction. So, uh, okay, uh, if I understand it well, Anthony, um, we're talking the, the keystone wall is uh, going to retain that six meter uh, embankment where it has uh, the road on top. Six meter is not a, a big um, number of, in height. Um, however, uh, it can, as long as we have room to uh, accommodate the uh, geogrids behind the wall, um, that, that shouldn't be a, a problem. Um, most of our walls we design actually to support roads on top, uh, so traffic surcharge. I hope this answers your question, but uh, yeah, please let me know if this is not uh, the, uh, the answer to your question. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Amir. And Mark, uh, Ravi is asking you, does it need a concrete footing for a retaining wall? Thanks, Amanda. So, look, this probably goes in part with some of the questions that the mayor just answered around expansion joints and whatnot in the footing. So, um, the, the footing or concrete levelling strip for the use in these walls. So, typically, you'd see a, um, a six hundred wide by one hundred and fifty or so thick uh, concrete levelling strip, which really is only for the blocks to sit on um, to provide a level surface for the block layers to, to lay the wall straight to get things right when they're starting to bring the wall up. Um, as I explained in my seminar earlier, the, the key structural um, component of the wall is the mass soil um, zone and the me mechanical stabilisation by the geogrid layers. So as we say, for that, you know, roughly six metre high wall, that soil block might be seven metres long uh, and that overall length is what's providing the, um, the structural support for the wall and that 600 mil wide um, concrete footing is really only a levelling strip. And when you come back to the question about whether you need to provide expansion joints in that footing or not, um, typically it's unusual to see expansion joints in that footing because it is only providing a, a mechanism for the blocks to be laid on unless you do have those other specific requirements like bridging that Namir mentioned earlier. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And Namia, we've had a question coming in from, from Mark. Good evening. And asking, oh, thank you for your presentation. So thank you, Mark, for watching. Uh, Mark's asking, what is the de design life for the retaining wall systems, Namia? Thanks, Mark. Uh, it's, uh, it depends on the, um, uh, the client or what the, the, the purposes of uh, this uh, retaining structure. If it is a, um, a roading infrastructure type project, normally uh, they will um, ask for 100 or 120 years design life. For other structures, it goes down to 80 or 50 uh, years and I'm talking uh, like commercial and industrial applications. Um, however, the walls that ha have been built um, many, many years ago uh, have been actually uh, uh, built allowing for that 100 years in, in general uh, design life. And it, it is capable of um, um, living through that design life uh, and performing well because of uh, what we um, mentioned before, both Mark and myself, of uh, the, the reasons why these uh, systems work and perform uh, throughout the design life. Thank you. Thanks, Namir. And I just want to talk, uh, we're coming towards the end of this webinar, but I want to talk a little bit about materials. Uh, Gautam in WA has asked a question directing to you, Namir. What materials are currently used? Can it be substituted by geopolymer, cement, concrete? 
Thanks, Gautam. Uh, the, um, the materials that are used currently are uh, for the blocks, uh, standard um, concrete, but uh, a high, uh, low slump, no, sorry, high slump concrete, so uh, very little water cement ratio. And the reason for that, it's, uh, it's a dry mix, so it gets to the block plant and gets compressed in, in the mold during manufacturing. And that's where the, the strength of the block we, I mentioned before, 21 MPA plus, is built. Um, to use a, a, a substitution uh, to the concrete, um, I don't see why not, given the fact that it needs to be workable in the manufacturing uh, system that, that I mentioned before. With the, uh, geo, uh, with the polymers, um, I, I, I'm not sure of the chemical uh, sort of components and how it performs in this manufacturing um, method. But if, if it does, then uh, again, I, I don't see why not, as long as it's viable and it does, um, the, you know, it suits for a purpose. Thank you. Thanks, Samir. Uh, we've talked quite a bit tonight about cost and asset life, etc. But We've had a question quite specific from Daryl in Queensland asking, you know, do, do we have a quick chart which explains the cost versus longevity of particular retaining wall designs? And he's used an example of a wooden retaining wall is cheap, lasts five to 10 years, concrete is more expensive and will last 20 plus years. Um, Namir, can you help Daryl? Uh, yeah, thanks, Darren. Uh, this is actually what we do all, all our uh, every day. Uh, is what's the the cost effective um, system that will help us first winning the job and performing and delivering on the the client's expectations. There's no straight answer of what is the cheapest. We don't have a list of uh, yeah, a comparison list between one system to the other. They all are good systems. They're all proven. They've all been used. It depends on that particular site uh, project or tender, the design requirements, the, the everything else that's related to the volume, the timing, the location, uh, you know, access, the availability of materials. In many cases uh, can play a, a role in our decision making, but. For, as a rule of thumb, um, and I, I'm, I'm just going to say this because I, I'm very connected to Keystone, we find Keystone uh, actually meets a lot of our um, uh, sort of requirements in terms of economics, performance, uh, and uh, pro uh, constructability. Thanks, Samir. And I sort of just want to finish up on a couple of things. I'm going to go to Mark first, but Namir, I just want you to have a think about what you see in the next 10, 20 years are going to be the big changes that is going to impact um, the industry going forward. But starting with you, Mark, um, Engineers Australia is hosting its flagship Climate Smart Engineering Conference in November. Um, and I just wanted to ask you, working with your clients when discussing climate change, etc., what sort of conversations are happening and where do you think those will lead to? Sure. So, look, most of the projects that we work on will um, have some green initiate, initiates um, associated with them. Um, typically, projects will have to have a climate ad adaptation and resilience plan prepared and included in all the, the planning documents um, which which go to either the you know, Department of Planning or local government authority. Um, in addition to that, most clients also take part in um, the Green Star program. Um, the, uh, the, the curved wall at the Horsley Drive Business Park that we noted um, in my slide there was actually the first um, five-star Green Star industrial um, precinct in Australia. Um, and you know, quite often we'll be looking at things in addition to the retaining wall structures uh, and designs there, we're, we're also looking at um, things relating to stormwater management like 
cleaning the water, removing nutrients and gross pollutants as part of the design, attenuating the stormwater runoff. Um, we're also looking at um, the impact of climate um, from increased rainfall intensities. Um, you know, the, the um, projection is for a 15% increase in rainfall intensity, though less overall rainfall events, but more intense. So we need to ensure that our designs are able to cater for that increased rainfall intensity. Uh, also sea level rise again by 2050, it's um, required for us to be assessing our designs based on a 300 millimetre rate rise in sea level. Um, also as part of the Green Star process, we're looking at heat island effects. Um, you know, some of our uh, asphalt pavements are being painted green to reduce heat island effect from um, you know the black asphalt which absorbs the heat so there's various initiatives that are that are included as part of the design to uh, improve the overall um, environmental outcomes of the project thank you mark thank you for that and amir what do you see based on your wealth of experience the big changes the disruptors what's this world going to look like um 10 20 years from now you're talking the general uh, retaining wall world or yeah, yeah. General, the whole yeah. plant is what do you think is the things that's going to have the biggest impact I, on change well i think the with the what we've seen in recent years uh, the development the technology the new initiatives um i think there will be a new uh, methods of um, uh, retaining um, you know, introducing new retaining walls, new methods of installing these walls, and um, even more less, less labor, but more um, uh, machinery, mechanical installation. Um, and then what Mark was was also uh, telling that us that there is uh, a lot of um, plans for future jobs in near future and uh, medium term. So uh, we can see there's a lot of uh, work coming. So uh, the industry would need to be more prepared for how to actually get um, all these uh, projects uh, built in a safe way and in an economical way and, and uh, uh, you know, in an aesthetic uh, uh, pleasing way. Thank you, Mamiya. Thank you for that. And it is all, all we have time for tonight. And I'm sure you'll join me in thanking our amazing speakers, Mamiya, Asmaro and Mark Wilson for their time and sharing insights in this evening's session. I'd also like to thank Engineers Australia's longstanding industry partner, Austral Masonry, for making tonight's webinar possible. Um, for more webinars in the speaker series, please follow the YouTube link in the description box. As always, we're looking for feedback, good, bad, um, and ideas for future, for future events. So if you could please complete the short feedback form in the description box below. Um, thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you very soon in our next webinar. Good evening. <laughs>